right, I've actually pitched doing a dedicated video on this because I think it's such an interesting thing. So I don't know if you, I don't know if any of you saw the last 12 months, there was a thing called COVID. I don't know if, it's, if that's been on your mm, radar. COVID? There was this virus sort of gone around the world and everybody sort of been, it's kind of, it's really, it's messed with a lot of stuff, but it was this big thing, this big thing called COVID-19, right? And when the World Health Organization were putting together their strategic response to this, they wanted to use existing models the things that had already happened in the world, right? Now, unfortunately, if you want to go and look at like general pandemics, you have to go all the way back to like the Spanish flu was like the last time something went global and had this kind of impact. But of course, society is very different to it was then. So it's very hard to predict how things are going to go, how certain restrictions are going to work, how basically the tactics you would use to combat it that would use then, it's difficult to work out how that was, how that would translate now. And unfortunately, all the more modern uh, diseases that have spread have all been far more localized, like your bird flu, your SARS, they didn't really go global, they didn't really jump across borders. So the things that were put in place for that, you don't know how that's gonna work on a global scale. So they had no really good model for how COVID was gonna work and how something that could get across the entire globe and jump through borders. They had no model for what to do with it. But the only thing they had, the only like test case, the only, the only case study they had for something in the modern world that was on the same scale as COVID was World of Warcraft. Because yeah. years ago, there was a virus in World of Warcraft, a corrupted bit of code that spread from player to player, and it was across the entire game. It started in one localized setting, and it moved and moved and moved. And they looked at all the things Blizzard did to try and restrict its movement and how people responded to the restrictions, how people followed the advice, how people didn't take it seriously. And it genuinely led to the WHO telling all these governments, look, you can close your borders and you can put in social distancing and you can bring in these restrictions, but it will not be effective. You need to police these things because people will not change the way they behave by and large if they don't think it's serious. And they literally kept going back to the corrupted blood thing in World of Warcraft. <laughs> we know this because in World of Warcraft, players were told your stuff will be deleted, you will lose all your things, that and the other. You need to keep away from certain areas, you need to not do this. But people were like, well, I just want to, I want to play the game. It doesn't affect me. I'm not bothered to play the game. So they started ignoring all the restrictions that were put in place. And WHO literally kept going back to this corrupted blood thing in World of Warcraft as their case study for why the code COVID restrictions needed to be really well enforced, needed to be really strict, and you couldn't just trust people to listen to the government advice because they were like, look, it happened. And if you don't know what the corrupt blood thing is, by the way, there was a boss fight in a very particular area that had this uh, this spell which could, they would like, it drastically reduced all your hit points and it could completely kill your character. And the way it was supposed to work was it was only supposed to affect certain players. It was only supposed to be on a timer and it was only supposed to work in a very specific region of the map. But the code was written wrong. So there was no timer on it. It was indefinite and it would work anywhere. And all of a sudden, all the little, all the creatures in the game that weren't being controlled by players started contracting it. They started getting affected by it and spreading it throughout the game. So all it's in the, in the weeks and the months it took them to rewrite all this code and get all the bugs out of this thing, it like decimated World of Warcraft. It's the closest thing that the World Health Organization has to a modern pandemic case study, and it was it was World of Warcraft. We're just we're just My favorite behind the scenes after that video. Doomed. That is insane. We're doomed. We're just living that South Park episode. Just sort of if reality couldn't be any more ridiculous. If if, if, one... way, if anybody wants me to do a full video on this, there's way more of this which I haven't even touched on here because uh -huh. that my friends need their time as well if you want the full video on this drop it in the comments and i will use that as leverage to get it made <laughs> <laughs> well i grew up playing animal crossing i loved it this wholesome cute little game um spend hours and hours on it and i never really thought anything of the little um the little logo little leaf with a little bit taken out of it like a bite mark i was just thought it was um it was random it was just a cutesy little icon maybe making a little mockery of like um the apple logo with a little but it actually has a reason behind it. Oh. And I didn't know that. Yeah, because that thing is everywhere and is incredibly recognizable. Yeah, and especially it's linked to Tom Nook. And that actually plays into uh, the logo as a whole and where it comes from. So in Japanese folklore, there is um, some meanings attached to this little creature called a tanuki. I might not be saying it correctly, but you get the meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a raccoon dog. It's quite cute, but you know if you got too close to it, it would just absolutely destroy you. Um, and obviously in real life, it's just a little animal minding its business. But in the folklore, there is uh, this uh, folklore um, that it's able to turn leaves into money. 
and other things related to bringing wealth upon um, those who encounter it. Um, also, uh, I just had to take a quick look at my notes to make sure I'm not making all of this up, um, but legends say that it has um, shape-shifting powers and that the things that give it the shape-shifting powers is magical leaves. Um, so what I thought was just a completely random cutesy little logo actually has deeper meaning that's related to the games uh, other than obviously the player character, one of the most central characters. You think of Animal Crossing, you think of Tom Manook. Um, yeah. And so that's that's the meaning behind it. Little Tom Manook though. Amy, like... can, I, can I just say, I can't believe, not only have I had that little mind blow bit about the leaf looking like the Apple logo, but I know what a Tanuki is, and I've just clocked that Tom Nook, T Nook, is a Tanuki. <laughs> <laughs> How much is realizing that it's now? Through the looking glass now, again. people. <laughs> oh, all this time I didn't realize that Captain D. Arg was actually a lovable canine companion. I guess money does go on trees. Womp womp. <laughs> So for my one, I need to take you all back to... The thing is, in researching this point, I knew that the vague tidbit, the, the core of the story is that Xbox, the Xbox brand, only literally exists as a video game tie-in brand because some dude in the corner of a room said that's a good idea at some point. And so I went into researching this and James Dow sent me the link to the specific interview that it was from that I'd sort of lost. It's over on IGN. It's one of the old IGN unfiltered interviews where they're talking to what who would become one of the co-creators of Xbox, this dude called Ed Freeze, who was in this meeting with um, Bill Gates and of other people not mr freeze adam cleary that would be well, a more nefarious thing i'm but, sorry but if his name is ed freeze then he is literally mr. he is literally <laughs> mr freeze <laughs> all the letters to his like house fries is to as well wow. yeah but anyway um when he wasn't out there saving his wife he was pitching ideas to Bill Gates. <laughs> And, um, and so he was in this meeting, uh, it was like him and like two or three other people, and apparently they decided they were going to go in and have this big meeting with Bill Gates. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And they went in and they pitched this whole idea of Xbox. Apparently Bill Gates took that as a massive personal insult. His literal quote was, this is an insult to everything I've done at this company. And he threw down the briefing on the table and he really didn't want to do it. Um, and what proceeded was four hours Good. of debates between Bill Gates and this room of people just saying, well, we should do it because of this. It makes a whole lot of sense. We should you know, aim for the living room. We should aim for people. We should aim for people's bedroom. We should make some video game consoles. And apparently it took four hours. And at one point, literally after the four hour mark at eight o'clock at nighttime, there was this dude in the corner who Ed Freeze doesn't even give his name, some senior man. This who's... is like Jaws. I'm sorry to cut you off. This is like yes. when Quint walks in with Jaws and puts his hand on the chalkboard and goes, yeah. I'll capture it for 500, <laughs> kill it for double. So he, this dude apparently um, piped up after four hours of intense debates where Bill Gates is very annoyed and just literally said, what about Sony? And apparently Bill Gates stopped talking. This guy that he was arguing with stopped talking. They both looked at him and went, what about Sony? And then Bill Gates took a second and went, yeah, fine, we should do it. And greenlit the entire Xbox brand there and then on the spot. And it wasn't going to do anything before then. Bill Gates hated the idea before this exact moment in time, which I just think is fascinating. But also alongside that, um, the more you look into old school, you know, Xbox getting off the ground stuff, um, it's ridiculous. The fact that the Xbox is green, like the Xbox color is green, is literally because before they went into a design meeting, that was the only color marker pen they had. Oh yeah, I remember that was, that one. That's ridiculous. Everything else was used, and apparently they'd lent them out to a bunch of people across the office. The uh, other dude called uh, Seamus Blackley um, was saying that the, the only color they had left in this marker pen set before they went in was green. So they'd done a whole bunch of, uh, of sketches in this green, and it just became the brand color, um, which is just ridiculous. And It's a nice green, yeah, to be fair. It is a very nice green, to be fair. Um, and also, one last thing, one little tidbit, is um, the big old Duke controller, the massive one, that like the dinner plate style one. Um, the fat controller. The big fat controller, the original PH fat controller. Um, that was that size because, uh, according to Seamus Blackley, again, one of the other co-creators, um, that chipset for the controller was designed overseas before they'd done any ergonomic research whatsoever in the West or anywhere worldwide. And they then had to make a controller shape fit that massive oversized chipset. <laughs> so that was why it was just this ridiculous thing. I thought um, it was because they hated children. That apparently as well, <laughs> but you know, it's there to do something to get the brand back on back on track. But yeah, the, the original first few years of Xbox, hilarious, brilliant, tragic, genius. Mine is nowhere near as interesting as any of you's because like, this is like a thing that I, when I was young and I discovered how video games are made. Like when you're young, you just play a video game. You're like, oh, it's just a, it's just a thing. It's just a video game. I'm playing it. I don't need to know the behind the scenes processes that, that give life to the pixels on my TV on screen. Living back then. But the game that changed all of that, my friend, was Midtown Madness 3. Now, I, um, during like, when I was like seven or eight, I kind of had a big car phase. I was like, oh, I really love minis and the Italian job. The Italian job was massive for me when I was younger. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. Especially the remake in 2003, which is a very underrated movie, I'll have you know. 
And uh, there was the Italian job game. But what I really wanted was an open world car game. And Midtown Madness 3 came along and it was like, oh, I had a mini on the cover. I was like, I want Midtown Madness 3. So we got Midtown Madness 3. I've said Midtown Madness 3 too many times right now. Uh, <laughs> it's made by DICE, who would obviously go on to do Battlefield. They'd already done one Battlefield game at that point, I believe. Um, and I got bored one day. I was like, I'm kind of bored with playing Midtown Madness 3. So you just browse the menus and you know how like, you have like extras in old video game menus. And you'd be like, oh, okay, well, I'll click on extras and see what comes up. And there was a documentary for Midtown Madness 3 about motion capture and how, how uh, you know, that process, how all the civilians that you can almost run over in that game, they all dive out of the way to mm -hmm. give it the, the sweet Peggy 3 rating um, and how that actually gets made. And it's actually a mockumentary. It's a, it's a big piss take of like um, how, you know, motion capture, you know, even though it is like a very serious thing, you know, they try and compare it with the same degree of reverence to something like, you know, something that's more Arthur-esque, like an actual actor or whatever. And it's all about this guy in this like, um, in this mocap suit, learning to dive out the way of this, this fake man with the fake car. And I thought it was drive fascinating him, at the time. And I think at the time I knew it was taking the piss, but equally I was so engrossed in the idea of this one man's struggle to learn how to dive out of the way of a car that I was just like, this is incredible. I didn't know that you just stick some balls on a black like morph suit and then that's how they make the people do lifelike things in the game. That's that that's amazing. Well, We've all we've all played a Nintendo at one point. I'm calling it a Nintendo for like the parents out there that call every video game console a Nintendo. And we've all sort of like come across a PlayStation in our time, but why was the place why is the PlayStation around? Like why did we have it? And it's because it's probably because the, the guy in the corner of the Xbox meeting smoking his cigarette was actually in the corner of these meetings between Nintendo and Sony back in the day where Sony were making sound chips for some of the earlier consoles they made and they wanted to you know get into the worlds of discs they, the, the idea of putting games on discs thanks to sega was like well we need to do this now before you know b before things get heated up the attitude era is like five years away so what happened was sony came together with nintendo and they were like okay come on here's a contract we we sort you out mate we sort you out so that's, nintendo were like oh that's very nice they failed to re uh, this was in 1988 by the way they failed to read the fine print was oh by the way but we get all the profits from the discs and we get a lot of the license fees and nintendo like one of the finest out the, the, the last hours in like 91 realized what was going on. i was like oh, we can't do that we, we'll we'll die we'll be dead so they at the last minute they were they just literally went no and then all the, all these products that sony had started all these prototyping everything like that just was wasted and in the bin like some of them i think one of them leaked out like a few years back yeah someone um, found like an old original the original playstation type thing yeah the nintendo well. it's it's weird seeing like a a playstation but with the gray nintendo plastic in it sort mm. of thing and and it just the, the idea that this almost came to be but by doing this sony and, and I'm, I'm forgetting all the names because if i was going to remember all the names it'd be a documentary it's just all too long to go through but they were just like well that's it this is war and so what they did is they went do whatever you need to do to crush them and then they just spent the next decade making the playstation when it was then getting the playstation 2 out and bringing nintendo almost to their knees until uh, xbox came along and nintendo went uh we should make a wii instead because at this point nintendo went and made their greatest competitor and uh in all means like the biggest video game sort of like obviously microsoft and microsoft and then they can just throw a billion at you and make you do what you want but in terms of just gaming the biggest gaming entity there is in terms of publishing and they create their own enemy and they start this war by just just turning them off at the last minute but then they were both t trying to screw each other so it's like well we're going to get them with all this money and then it, it, it's just an amazing like companies are so devious and mischievous but you don't really ever hear so many stories where it's just like well we're just gonna destroy we're gonna destroy them for this <laughs> and that's just to me that they're still fighting the fight now but it just it's an amazing story to be fair